Uh, good afternoon. Welcome back. Kent Bain with Nine Business Group and Elevate Your Business. Uh, business spotlight interview today. We, we have the pleasure of Justin joining us. Justin, please introduce yourself and uh, your last name because I'm probably going to mispronounce it and your company. What makes you unique and different? Sure. Uh, so Justin Gorzitsa is how you actually say that. And uh, basically, I own a store called One Guy Garage, um, which encompasses a few different businesses. So uh, I guess if I gave you a little bit of our history, we started out uh, doing e-commerce exclusively selling uh, high performance hose to guys down in the US. And that started in 2017. Um, that business uh, really started from nothing, an idea on a golf course. And we, we got some product in and tried sampling it. And then what happened was uh, it kind of took off. We ended up selling out in a couple of weeks and uh, guys kept uh, coming back and asking for more and different things. So as we got asked for more and different things and a few years go by and the business continued to grow, um, we figured, okay, well, what naturally ties into what we were doing with e-commerce was uh, further automotive parts. And uh, we kind of also realized that uh, the industry was a bit broken. Um, a bit broken in, you know, technology, especially, and also how go to market was. So it's almost like the auto parts industry decided to skip on um, the basic changes that happened in retail uh, that you got everywhere else. So lots of times you can go into a store and, you know, there, there's no price tags on the shelf. If you go to a one counter guy, you'll get a different price than the counter guy two blocks over, you know, and, and it just uh, was never consistent. So there was opportunity and gaps in the market. We realized to uh, go after a retail, you know, front facing business, but also bring in technology and e-commerce and those types of things to the back end to tie it in together, to give one experience. Um, so no matter what touch point a customer hits, uh, we want them to have a great, great experience. And so that's, uh, that's how we decided to go after it. Amazing. Good for you. In those five years, I guess probably pushing six years now, what's been the biggest challenge you've had to overcome? How did you tackle it? How did you solve it? And what was the outcome today? Uh, well, there's been a lot of challenges. Um, I would say the biggest uh, business challenge would probably be just uh, paying for everything. Um, this whole business has been bootstrapped start to finish. So we've financed it based on previous sales. And uh, I guess the one thing that we didn't realize when we first opened was how much inventory you actually need to carry in order to successfully have an auto parts store. You know, we kind of estimated, okay, we need a couple hundred thousand and that's turned into, you know, 800,000. So to have to pay for all that cash in a period under two years uh, sure took, took a ton of, uh, I guess, creativity to make sure that it, uh, it continued to move forward. And, uh, you know, when we first got the initial order for the e-commerce business, you know, five, years ago now or just over five years ago um that came in cool that was paid for but the next big order was actually financed with uh, you know kind of like one of those loan shark places so uh, we ended up uh, you know 37 percent interest uh, you know went down there and took it and ordered the product in but uh, you know it kept selling and we kept moving it and uh, you know eventually we had that paid off pretty quick so it didn't didn't hurt too long but uh, it was definitely you know a risk but a calculated risk to do that and then you know, moving forward, luckily that business, uh, you know, the online e-commerce has continued to do well. So it's paid for the inventory that we now have on hand. So um, at some point we'll have to go buy it and, and we'll be able to move it into the next store, but uh, we'll see when that happens. That's a, that's a great risk though. But I think if I were to summarize, that's a, a huge investment from your behalf into the client base, right? So it's not just an investment in inventory, but without the inventory, you can't keep the clients. So it's a very strategic decision to make the investment in inventory as, as a client retention tool, true? Oh, it's absolutely needed. I mean, if you don't have it, you can't sell it. So uh, it's pretty important. Um, we're fortunate that it's not a grocery store and you know this stuff doesn't technically expire. Um, it does get outdated. So you wanna make sure you're staying on top of it and clearing out the old stuff so you're not sitting on 20 year old parts that nobody uses anymore. Um, but uh, yeah, it doesn't expire. So it's not like uh, you know a filter on the shelf is gonna hurt anybody if it uh, gets sold after six months, but you, know, you still sure. wanna turn it over often and as much as possible, so. Yeah, no kidding. Uh, what is one thing you know now that you wish you would have known five and a half, six years ago before you started in business? Uh, I would say that we probably should have hired differently. Um, you know, when we brought started building the team, we kind of started bottom and worked our way up. I think I would have probably put an operations type of person in charge first to help me build it um, rather than me doing it myself with a team. You know, I, I used to run big teams when I had other jobs and corporate jobs that, uh, you know, cool, but you had middle management in the middle to help you. 
And here we didn't have that. So I had to do multiple hats, which I guess is the, the life of an entrepreneur. But uh, I think if I was to do it again differently, definitely get that operations guy in place first. Um, so if there's that second level, I guess, to, to make some decisions, though, you always have to be the guy. It is a tough one. You know, I, when I work with uh, some of the tradespeople, often ask them, okay, in their staffing and hiring policy program, is like, who do you hire next? And they go, well, I, you know, I, often they say, well, an apprentice, you know, a junior employee. And it's like, well, that's the one person, you know, on, on the tradesperson side that doesn't make you any money because you need a, a senior person with them to be certified and get the job done. And I think your point, it's a tough balancing act between to hire somebody who can think and, and move like I can. So we kind of have somebody to share the workload with, or do I need somebody just to delegate to and for them to kind of, I don't know, for lack of better words, sweep the floors and stock the shelves. And I don't think there's any answer other than, you know, what works and doesn't work and you figure it as you go. So thank you for sharing. If there was a pirate in your business, a thief, uh, what would they be stealing from you? Could be any number of things. Could be cash, could be product, could be time, could be customers. Yeah, could be all of the above. <laughs> so lots has of, there lots been, of what, like, of, of those, is there one that has been more fleeting for you or harder to kind of keep your hands around? Maybe it's the time one or uh, maybe the cost of inventory. So it's more of a cash flow issue. What's been the hardest one for you to keep your hands on? Um, I think building the right team has been the biggest challenge, which would be the time thing. I mean, they kind of tie hand in hand there. Um, when it comes to having the right person on the floor, what they spend their time doing, is it driving results for the business or is it just wasting time? And, and unfortunately, you know, we had to learn the hard way with that where there was some wasted time or, or time that was spent that wasn't, uh, you know, valuable. And I think I go back to when I said, you know, hire an operations person. Um, you know, I was so busy trying to figure tech stuff out and get us online and, and do other kinds of stuff that a lot of stuff did slip through the cracks. Um, you know, we're in a better position today and we, we've changed the compensation structure to more align to the goals of the business and, and things like that to help. But definitely there was, you know, a year and a half where we had to, I guess, pretend it didn't happen and, and make the changes so that we could continue to move forward. Uh, cool. What is your definition of a successful business? Is it different today than it was in 2017? Has it modified or has it gotten tighter? Uh, I think... My idea of a successful business, well, I mean, the goal for this is to open 40 of these stores um, across Canada. So a big part of that is going to be, you know, making sure operations are, are figured out so that we can duplicate it and, and from there. But really, I mean, at the end of the day, if this business is successful, it means we got a team that wants to work with us. We got customers that are partners. And when we go to market, we really say, okay, we want partners as customers, we want team members as partners, everybody across the board you know, works together. And, and I think, you know, one thing that stands out for me there is, you know, if you're truly a partner with a customer, it's not necessarily the customer's always right, right? There's, we're going to screw up and we're, we're going to make it right whenever possible. But if you're truly a partner, sometimes the customer's wrong and you got to be comfortable telling them that, and you know what, hey, we're, we're moving forward together. This is the mistake. Let's figure it out and, and go forward. Um, you know, sometimes, and especially in my history, big business, all the customer phone and they were mad. So my boss is mad at me now. Well, did the customer maybe screw up? Is it their fault? Because are they, are they worth keeping as a customer sometimes, you know? I, I think it doesn't matter if you've been in business for one year or 10 years. When you have that moment, it becomes very clear as to um, who's in charge of the relationship. But if it's not a win-win, then, then it's not fun. It's not fun for you. It's not fun for the customer. Uh, I agree. And, and yeah, sometimes you got to let the client move on and find a different supplier, a different person to the, where the uh, values align. Because if they're not there and, and they're causing more pain and suffering for you, then not good in the long term. When, when yeah, absolutely. Thing, when this thing is said and done, what are you really known for? Five years from now, 15 years from now, uh, what's the legacy? What's the the two to three sentences that you want to be known for? Well, kind of when we put it pen to paper, it's uh, we want to be known as a business where a guy's comfortable coming in and having a beer with you. You know, a little bit different than what you hear from some some businesses or corporations or whatever. Really, that's it. When we talk about partners, hey, we want to have a beer with a guy and he's comfortable coming and just shooting the the well i guess i don't know if i can say that on youtube but uh, you get the picture <laughs> um you know and if we can duplicate that across 40 boxes where every place has that feeling and you have those guys who come in and they they want to have that kind of relationship with you then then i think we've won and uh, same goes for team members so if everybody's comfortable with each other and having a good time then then life is good
Uh, I gotta, I gotta, we got a few more minutes. I want to dig into that one if that's okay. It's like, so for your locations, even for your own store, can, do you mind sharing with us approximately how many clients you serve and, and what steps have you taken internally? Because I, I, the, motive, the note I wrote down here is okay, being known for that personal customer relationship. So the, akin to being on a first name basis with your clients. Is that a fair summary? And so the question, if that's a fair summary, yeah, it can be a good, good summary, right? first name basis, or you know that kind of relationship, or you, they're just you're known as the place where it's it's cool to hang out, I guess, something like that, where it's it's almost got that atmosphere where it's, I don't know, cheers or whatever you want to call it, but where guys show up. But I mean, as far as you know, internally, what we've kind of done and what we're working on is really you know, what does the second, third, fourth, and fifth store look like as far as how does the leadership look in that store? Um, specifically, you're not going to build that culture with a leader who doesn't believe in it. So how do they have a piece of the success of the business? Um, the other thing too, and you know, this is something that some of my partners and us talk about, cause we all came from a retail background, you know, how do you keep it without having to have, you know, 10 levels of middle management to, to just get in the way almost, you know, at the same time though, if you're leading the store, what does your future look like? If you don't have that 10 little, little, little layers at middle layers of management that you don't get a promotion, you know, after five years. So how do you keep them engaged? So that's one of the challenges we kind of talk about is how do we duplicate it? Keep a guy in a store for 20, 30 years, still want to continue with the business and, uh, you know, do well year after year after year and push for growth all the time. Um, trying to figure that out still. I mean, we've kind of looked at some models, you know, Greg's distributors has a decent model where, you know, they got a limited partnership where the main business owns and then there's also independent owners in, in each store kind of thing. So they, you know, that's kind of the way we're leaning right now. Um, but a lot of these stores, we also want to take over through acquisition. Um, so how do you get the culture in place? So we see an opportunity in mid market cities. Um, there's a lot of guys who want to retire who started a store 30, 40 years ago and they don't have an exit plan. And they also do things like it was done 20, 30 years ago. You know, I've seen places where they're still doing inventory decisions based on spreadsheets um, or manually walking around and ordering based on what they see on the shelf. Um, so right there, I mean, you're, you're inefficient and you're losing money just because you're doing it that way. Um, no e-commerce presence whatsoever, you know, stuff like that. So we see an opportunity where we can go into a place, acquire it, implement some technology, get the technology to pay attention and learn based on what the robots decide and uh, then kind of move forward at a higher profitability level while still building the culture with a team, you know, that's there. It sounds amazing and great vision for you. Thank you for sharing with us. It makes me think of a friend of mine who travels to Singapore about once every two years and he goes to what well, we akin to the seven star hotel and he goes, it's always amazing. I walk in and, and I'm not even, he goes, I haven't checked in. I haven't checked in for more than five minutes. And I'm walking to my room and somehow every single employee I pass along the way to my room knows me my name. I don't know, I can't remember the name of the hotel, but it's an amazing experience. So I think it's kind of those things we might have to share with you and put it on your bucket list to go experience. Because I think the hardest part about yeah. is that is one customer service is dying. I agree. It's a it's a with the use of robots and machines, even walking into your typical McDonald's now, punching in your order, um, you know, using robots to place orders in restaurants. It, where is that customer service going and, and how do we keep it at a profitable level? I great challenge to accept for sure. Um how do you, how are you going to help uh, your employees and your team members be able to remember the names of your customers? Is there a process you use now or is it still kind of um, in the workshop and, and being cultivated as we speak? Uh, well, I think, you know, the message kind of we've given to them is, is really don't always have to be the hero, if that makes sense. So, you know, if they're the hero because they have to fix a problem. You know, yeah, they probably remember that guy's name and the guy remembers his name, but it's because of a bad experience. So the message has always been, why not just create every experience really good? Um, and we, we've kind of been really talking about that. And then at the same time, they have an ownership level of the business, right? So they're able to make decisions without having to phone me or rely on me. And I think if we can build the culture from the bottom up that way, um, it'll continue where they have that relationship that's a little bit more specialized. Um, you know, technology again helps. So everybody that comes in this business, they, they get an account where they, you know, like, okay, what's your phone number? Here's your name. So, you know, we keep track of stuff, which actually from an experience standpoint, um, you know, we know what vehicle you looked up last time. So a guy comes in, Hey, I, I need oil for my truck. Oh, is that the F-350? Yeah, it is actually. How did you know that? Well, it's in the computer, right? Cause the first thing we're asking him is what's your phone number? Um, you know, 
part of that too is being able to stay in touch with them. So, you know, through text message, whether it's email, whether it's Facebook live chat or online website chat or, you know, wherever it's all the touch points that get hit rather than just face to face. Um, you know, things like oil changes, we're looking at an option to where it says, you know, it's been six months reminder, don't forget to come pick up your oil. So, you know, obviously it's a sales opportunity, but also it's a good customer service service thing for a guy who maybe doesn't, doesn't remember or doesn't do it all the time or, you know, things like that. So we're busy, just uh, we're busy. And for the average person who, whether you're a farmer, you're working in the oil patch or you're a construction guy, you're busy making money. You're not necessarily thinking about the oil chain. So it is a service, hundred percent agree. Uh, so before we wrap up one last plug for your kind of state, who your ideal client is, and then where would that ideal person find you to do business with you guys, whether it be online or your local store? Sure. So ideal customer, you know, for us really right now is anybody who has a fleet of vehicles um, doing lots of heavy duty work. Um, they typically have a mechanic in house. Um, they're buying their own and sourcing their own parts. Um, and the reason that I say that is we're really good at doing vendor managed inventory, coming in, support and making sure, you know, you got a fleet, 10 vehicles, your filters are full on the shelf. You don't got to screw around, to, you know, coming and phoning us. It's just done. Um, so we're saving those customers time um, and ultimately money because they don't have to send a guy into town to go pick up that one thing that's missing for something simple like an oil change or, you know, a filter for a tractor or whatever it is. Um, as far as finding us, uh, we're located at 3213 2nd Ave North and Lethbridge. Um, recently expanded about 12 months ago, so we doubled our footprint. And uh, obviously, we need to fit all that inventory we bought in here. So that was the reason why. Um, online, oneguygarage.ca, uh, and on the phone, 403-388-4350. Perfect. Thanks again, Justin. Uh, keep up the amazing work, and we're looking forward to uh, meeting with you in a couple of weeks to uh, take a look at your business and uh, maybe do a deep dive on some of those uh, fun challenges that you've uh, challenged yourself with and see if we can uh, shorten that gap from here to your definition of success. So thanks again. Have a great week. Thank you.